Nashville, Tennessee. She earned an MA in Religion and Ethics from Yale D University Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut, and a Bachelor of Science degree from Tennessee State University in Nashville. Her teaching and research interests are, are in womenist feminist theology, social critical theory, critical studies, economics, and Afro-Pentecostalism. Her first academic book, Unfinished Business, Black Women, the Black Church, and the Struggle to Strive in America was published in November 2012. Her second book, Religious Resistance to Neoliberalism, Womenist and Black Feminist Perspective, was published in December 2015. In 2017, she was recognized by ABC News as one of the six women, six black women, at the center of gravity in the theological education in America. She has been a guest political commentator on NPR, Huffington Post Live, amongst others, on issues related to faith and politics. She has written for the Dallas Morning News, Faith and Political Blog, The Feminist Wire, and The Huffington Post. Please help me welcome the Reverend Dr. Carrie Day. Good afternoon. I am elated to uh, be here today to really join and participate in a very important conversation on reparations. Um, of course, it's my understanding that there has been this weekend um, many different events sort of commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Black Manifesto, as well as sort of the recognition um, that this is a very important conversation going on in our national political community right now, as well as our diverse ecclesial communities. And so again, I'm very happy to be here to uh, talk a bit about the future of reparations, where do we go from here, um, and to have the opportunity to also talk with the panel that will follow me um, about uh, this question. I definitely, before I begin, want to thank the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler for inviting me, as well as uh, Minister Kevin Van Hook. Many thanks for having me here to join this conversation. So most recently, three Democratic presidential candidates, as we all know, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, and Julian Castro, endorsed the concept of granting reparations to black Americans affected by slavery and discrimination. But I do think it's important to say uh, that this has, is debated today as it's always been. Um, there are other uh, presidential candidates um, that do not think that reparations is a good idea. I'm thinking here, for example, of Senator Bernie Sanders, who decried the call for reparations as divisive. But I think Generally speaking, right now within our national political community, there is an ongoing question, and the question is this. Is reparations part of the solution to repairing racial injustices? And if so, why? Well, I want to tell a story about why the call for reparations is first an American democratic tradition there um, have been some arguments made that reparations is essentially anti-democratic because um, it places the onus, the burden on a generation that has not committed the infractions of slavery, of Jim Crow uh, and the like. Um, so in this account, there's a sense in which this particular generation uh, is being harmed, their constitutional liberties and freedoms are being taken. Uh, and in this sense then, the call for reparations sits outside of the American democratic tradition. It sits outside of American democratic practice. So first what I want to talk about is the way in which reparations is an American democratic tradition, okay, of which Foreman finds his voice in. That's the first thing. It is an American democratic tradition that is cultivated by the underside of this country, marginalized communities. But then second, I want to tell a story about why the call for reparations is central to the Christian witness. 
It seems to me that this is what is incredibly important about the Black Manifesto, that uh, the call for reparations is not just a social or political imperative. That's important because it is about uh, the material restitution, so to speak, that enables a community to be economically self-determined in order to exercise their sense of political freedom. That is important. But there's a way in which reparations is also a theological imperative. What I want to advance is that reparations is a part of the gospel mandate. It's a political imperative, but it's a part of the gospel mandate. So as a constructive theologian and ethicist, I first, like all, want to commemorate the legacy of the Black Manifesto, which was a 2,500 word document demanding $500 million in reparations from white American churches and Jewish synagogues for the lingering impact of slavery and the ongoing black disenfranchisement. The Black Manifesto radically vowed to back this demand by participating in church seizures, disruptions, of course we're talking about what transpires at Riverside in 1969, demonstrations, and force by any means necessary. Foreman and of course other leaders associated with the National Black Economic Development Conference imagined that the Black Manifesto would, for example, fund a southern land bank for cooperative farms, publishing houses to generate capital and jobs, TV networks to counter racist propaganda in the media. We need that right now. A grant to the National Welfare Rights Organization to assist welfare workers and recipients. There's a gendered component there, we see. A national labor strike and defense fund, and to support African liberation movements that were emerging abroad. In other words, the Black Manifesto announced a radical and ambitious program. But again, as I said just a second ago, this program is often discussed as anti-democratic, situated outside of the democratic tradition altogether. Even carnivalesque, I'm thinking of the cultural theorist Bakhtin, who talks about the idea of the carnivalesque uh, through this image, uh, the world that stands on its head, right? So this idea that something that is carnivalesque is grotesque, nonsensical, and therefore not legible on the moral landscape. And this is how reparations has been talked about, is that in some ways it's grotesque, it's nonsensical, it's not legible on the moral landscape when we think constitutionally, when we think about individual freedom and personal liberty, that it's sort of breaking this tradition. But of course, I want to ask, is it? So the first thing I think to acknowledge is that there are many different American democratic traditions. If there's anything that African American political traditions have taught us, is that when we speak of the American democratic tradition, that is never monolithic, because there is always an underside that is articulating democratic practice against hegemony, right? Against structures of domination. So I am suggesting that the call for reparations is an American tradition and not some aberration of uh, American democratic practice. And that's important for me because I'm wanting to historically situate Foreman within a much longer reparations tradition. Foreman writes the Black Manifesto and grounds its, um, it in the philosophy of reparations, but this philosophy is not a new or original idea. In fact, this document stands in a tradition of reparation language and strategy. So again, I want to interpret Foreman and his document within a historical context. So we tend to start with black male leaders when speaking about reparation philosophies 
and strategies, right, such as Foreman, or such as some leaders of uh, the black power. For those that want to go way back and they want to speak about perhaps the language of material restitution, they might invoke David Walker. But I want to turn to genealogies that have been hidden, ignored, and forgotten. So I'd like for us to consider Callie House, a black woman who advocates for reparations for the former enslaved right after the Civil War. She understood reparations as both a remedy for the rape, torture, death, and destruction of, to use her words, of millions of black human souls, but she also understood reparations as a measure that recognized that freedom without material resources would lock black people into second-class status for generations to come. That line rings, that sort of resonates with us, because when we think of that line, we think of Martin Luther King. But I want to sort of foreground Callie House as a predecessor that is thinking in this direction, that when we're talking about American democratic practice, we're not just talking about social recognition. And that is, what does it mean, say, as a black woman, for me to be socially recognized as having status as a citizen within our political community? That's important. But what she's also saying is that without economic self-determination, political freedom is literally an impossibility. This was Callie House. House was a Tennessee washerwoman and seamstress turned activist founding and leading the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty Pension Association. House founded this, um, this uh, Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association, and it advanced proposed reparations that linked payments to those born into slavery to pensions paid to former black Union soldiers. Along with white Democrat Walter Van Horn, she supported the first proposal for an, an, an ex-slave pension for black Union soldiers. But what's even more radical is that this House proposal also sought to put the name of every ex-slave on a petition asking Congress to pass a bill providing pensions. Every ex-slave on a petition asking Congress to pass a bill for pensions. This was a very important move as uh, no slaves had property, as we know, residence, education needed for economic independence. This ex-slave pension and relief movement, and this is Mary Frances Berry, who is the biographer of Cali House, uh, she writes that this particular movement found incredible opposition on all sides, just not among white communities, but among black communities. And many prominent newspapers, politicians, white and black, derided House's efforts as a distraction from the struggle for political rights and a hopeless cause. And more ominously, we know a little bit about her life after she worked for this movement for some time, that postal officials in Tennessee, where House lived, suppressed the movement, unfairly prosecuting House for mail fraud, as she often solicited funds through mail to support the organization. The important point here in me calling out Kali Hassi's name is that it foregrounds how House plays a historic role in being one of the first black leaders to put reparations on the table right after the Civil War. In other words, she is a trailblazer. But there were other conversations of reparations going on after the Civil War. And I'll say in a moment why Callie House's work is so important, insightful, and prophetic based on these other conversations. And I write a bit about this in my book, Unfinished Business. For some that are familiar with um, um, some of the programs that were coming out right after the Civil War, mainly Link Abraham Lincoln's executive order. So through Lincoln's executive order, land-based reparations were promised at the end of the Civil War. 
with ambitious programs undertaken in several significant communities in the South. In the Sea Islands off South Carolina and on the plantations owned by slaveholders, radical experiments in land redistribution to formerly enslaved people were undertaken explicitly as a form of reparation for slavery. So this is already happening at the national level after the Civil War. However, this historic enterprise of reparative justice came to an abrupt end after President Lincoln was assassinated and Andrew Johnson, a known slavery sympathizer, although I, I, do, although I, do, I would like to say this, Abraham Lincoln makes a decision to offer land-based reparations, in my opinion, not based on moral grounds, but based on pragmatic grounds. He had to legitimate the war that had just been fought. And so I think that that's a really important thing to note as I continue in talking about what is the responsibility of white churches in this call for reparations, and churches more broadly. Uh, but Andrew Johnson comes, uh, becomes president, a known slavery sympathizer. He assumed the presidency of the United States. Johnson vetoed a bill Congress sent to his desk that would have formalized the allocation of land to newly freed black people as reparations. And he granted amnesty to the former Southern Confederate landowners by signing an ironclad oath that restored all rights of property to these southern landowners except their slaves or the enslaved. And in this way, the land that had been set aside and granted to free people, black folks, to begin a new life was seized from them, often violently, and returned to their former owners, even though in many cases they had paid for title to the land at public auction. Freed black communities were then forced to enter into contract labor arrangements with plantation owners, what we have come to know now as sharecropping. The reason why this particular history, or this conversation, I should say, about reparations through the executive order is important to the conversation, I would like to think, although Callie House does not directly write about this, I would like to think that one of the reasons why she did not want to move in the executive order way is sort of an acknowledgement that in uh, offering up a policy proposal that based it on the whims of a president, that if one president died and another came in, it would be placed in a highly vulnerable position. I think there is something politically shrewd as well as wise and prophetic that she realized that a bill needed to be taken to Congress and that if this bill passed, it would at least be more difficult due to the extensive process that is in place to repeal this bill. So my point here is that she's really thinking creatively about what might be possible in terms of material restitution as well as symbolic restitution. So again, reparations was being announced and discussed as early as the Civil War. And the black woman was at the center of these conversations, attempting to raise prophetic, insightful, and creative questions about what was necessary and required for reparative work. So then we can fast forward to 1965, and we can see that reparations in some form, it is present with A. Philip Randolph, with King, which I'll talk about in a moment, but that these folks, I would argue, stand in the tradition of Cali House, right? So in 1965, and I'll just say this very quickly, that A. Philip Randolph, a black American labor, labor movement leader and supporter of social parties, if you recall, introduced the Freedom Budget, which requested that 185 billion be spent over a 10-year period to free millions of Americans from poverty and deprivation. Now for certain, while this freedom budget addressed poverty among all Americans, and I think the genius of the Black Manifesto is it zeroes in on people of the African diaspora that have incurred real material and symbolic harm, this is important. I think it is also important to note that Randolph knew that blacks disproportionately were affected 
by racial and economic injustice, and so would be particularly helped by the Freedom Budget. King and Rustin worked with Randolph on this bill and argued that this budget would be the full and final triumph of the civil rights movement, linking racial justice to economic justice. Scholars have also noted that Foreman borrowed economic concepts from King's Economic Bill of Rights for the Disadvantage. This bill that King, uh, as well as a community, bring together, the Economic Bill of, of Rights for the Disadvantage, the, this bill required 10 to 12 billion from the combined efforts of public and private sectors. And it was understood that the private sector area would include religious communities such as churches and particularly white churches. So there are some scholars that say that even in requiring um, some sort of financial reparative work is seen in some of the work that King was doing as well. In fact, a number of white pastors, Episcopal, Methodist, some Baptist pastors, agreed in principle with some sort of economic payment for a history of economic disenfranchisement among blacks. These were those marching with King in the ranks, the labor movement with Randolph. So if it is the case that some of them agreed, liberal uh, leaders in principle, that uh, reparations in some form was needed, what is it about the manifesto that created a firestorm of controversy, right? On one level, we know that, well, everyone didn't agree with reparations, that that was the work, right? But then there were some that did. So, so what is, what is the, the, the response, the outrage, so to speak, that we see in the cultural artifacts that surround the historical narration of the Black Manifesto? I just want to offer one suggestion, that one major, I think, threatening aspect of the manifesto is that it reflected the philosophy of radical revolutionary tactics, of radical revolution. And you can actually see that in some ways this is the case because when you turn to, again, some of the cultural artifacts, how various denominations uh, as well as newspapers are writing about the sort of commentary on the Black Manifesto, it's interesting that the introduction and the conclusion of the manifesto received the most attention. So for example, in the introduction of the document, it refers to white churches as colonizers, right? It refers to white churches as racist. Uh, in, uh, in the body as well as in the conclusion, it talks about in order to implement the Black Manifesto, it means bringing the government down. It talks about guerrilla warfare in the streets. It declares war on white Christian churches and synagogues. This is the language, right? And you see again within the cultural artifacts that there there are all these negative reactions that people are taken by the language, by uh, what is perceived as the violence of what is being said. And again, this is not only by white liberals, this is also by African American progressive folks, such as NAACP readers. Bayard Rustin is one that came out and really decried it as being effective at all. It detracted again from the political struggle. Um, Jewish leaders at well. And I just want to offer, because I'm, I keep saying cultural artifacts, such as, for example, editorials, I just want to offer maybe a couple of editor editorials, what was being written about, as well as a couple of denominational leaders, as a way of pointing to the disagreement being over the rhetorical strategy of the document, right? This is about the rhetorical strategy. So, for instance, the editorial team for the Christian Century wrote this. The real problem is not the idea of reparations. It is the effective implementation of the idea. And if the document's title word manifesto, along with its anti-capitalist ideology, rooted in the tragic history of the dehumanization of black labor, suggests Marxist language, we have a problem. Or consider the response of the presiding 
Bishop Hines of the Episcopal Church. In Christianity Today, he writes about the tactics of the document. And this is what he says. The language and basic philosophy of the manifesto are calculatedly revolutionary, inflammatory, Marxist, anti-Semitic, anti-Christian establishment, violent, and destructive of any democratic political process. So you see, again, it's being positioned as anti-democratic. So as to shock, challenge, frighten, and if possibly, overwhelm the institutions to which it is directed. In other words, it wants to frighten white folks. It wants to overwhelm structures of white power. It was no surprise, he goes on to write, it was no surprise that throughout the white establishment, the immediate response was, with a few exceptions, one of outrage, furious hostility, and disbelief. Consider the general board of the Disciples of Christ. They issued a statement on the Black Manifesto as well. And this was their statement. The Black Manifesto is an ideology we cannot accept and a methodology we cannot approve. Right here, methodology we cannot approve. In other words, I want to suggest that the disagreement, in large part, not the only reason, but one major disagreement was over the document's rhetorical strategy. Foreman wanted to do this by any means necessary. He was functioning as an agent provocateur in a lot of ways. And because I am a theological scholar doing constructive theology and ethics, um, I can imagine, at least in, in the schools that I have taught, that this is often, for example, the rub of the brilliant, brilliant, trailblazing black theologian James Cone, right? The rub is, in a lot of ways, it's not uh, for many, particularly uh, white communities, those that I've taught, whether at Bright Divinity School or Princeton Seminary, that the rub is completely the analysis of racial disenfranchisement, but rather the way he's doing it, right? So when I taught at Bright Divinity School, and I've written about this publicly, um, one of the things that uh, um, sort of happened in my introduction to ethics um, is after reading, well, really assigning, I should say, a book by James Cone, um, there was a group of white males that actually made a deci decision to protest the introduction to ethics being a required course as long as Cone was on the syllabus. When they were asked by the administration why, did they not agree with the historical analysis? They said yes. The two of the administrators said, well, what's the problem? Their response, it's the way he does it. The way he talks is divisive. He's violent and confrontational in how he says what he says. In other words, it's the problem of rhetorical strategy. But this revolutionary or radical language, I would argue, provokes us to sit with this deeper question. I think this is a question that church communities, particularly white church communities, have to sit with in having a conversation about reparations and Christian witness. And I, I imagine this is, this is part of what's at stake for both Foreman and Cone. How do we get the attention of white power structures in order to dismantle them? How do we get the attention of white power structures in order to dismantle them? History proves that white power structures do not respond to requests. In fact, when requests are made, what we have seen historically is that there is a doubling down, right? I mean, we move from emancipation to reconstruction. Reconstruction uh, in some parts of the nation, you see, for example, some of your first African-American politicians. You see uh, small African-American businesses that are emerging. But by and far, Reconstruction is a horrible, horrible failure. And when you go back and you read um, some of the narratives and testimonies, what could not be anticipated would be the form of a neo-slavery in the form of Jim Crow and Jane Crow law, that is segregation. Right? And you fast forward through Jim Crow law segregation to currently what Michelle Alexander refers to as the new Jim Crow 
What we discover is that, again, history proves that white power structures do not respond to requests. In other words, what I think that the Black Manifesto communicates is that any act of liberation entails a certain amount of force. And I want to qualify this category of force. Because, and, and again, this is something that Christian communities deeply wrestle with, right? On one level, we tend to think of force as being purely physical. But I think that um, those that participated in, uh, in demonstrations and movements of civil disobe disobedience, uh, such as King, such as Ella Baker, such as Septima Clark, uh, um, uh, Rosa Parks, and others, one of the things that they have all sort of, sort of a consensus communicated is that there are also other kinds of forces that are not necessarily physical, but compel white power structures to stand at attention and reckon with what has happened. So I'm thinking here, uh, King was deeply grounded in and influenced by Gandhi's philosophy of, of satigraha, right? And you think of satigraha um, in Hindi means truth force, right? But in this sense, part of what Gandhi talks about in, in sort of describing satigraha is that truth is a force, it is forceful when demonstrating injustice and the need to reckon with what's required in light of injustice. So you think again of the demonstrations. I mean, I've also written about this, that at the height of the demonstrations uh, that young college students were doing, SNCC with King, that around 12% were in solidarity. In fact, you had a, a, a many white communities, many African American communities that saw King as a propagandist using young bodies, putting young people on the lines in order to forward a movement, a very dangerous movement at that. Um, but even King understood that in order to make a nation reckon with what has happened, it involves a kind of confrontation, whether that's through political theater, whether that's through manifesto language, whatever it is, the point here is that there is a forcefulness to truth. And the question is, how do white power structures stand at attention and reckon with what has happened? I think part of this is taking seriously that power concedes nothing but to power, right? And so for Christian communities to continue thinking about their own uncomfortability surrounding this kind of conversation that Foreman is foregrounding. The uncomfortability over radical tactics is present today within reparations discourse. I don't know how many people have been following Princeton Theological Seminary, but we are right now undergoing um, a reparations uh, um, agenda of our own. About three years ago, the president, um, the president put forward a historical slavery audit task force that essentially was responsible of writing a report detailing Princeton Theological Seminary's historic complicity with the slave economy. And out of that report, which was introduced to the community and to uh, actually the broader nation through a conference uh, this year, um, really sort of wanted to foreground and ask the community what is needed by way of reparations. What I'm very proud to say that the Association of Black Seminarians did respond to this report and to a call for reparations. Um, and they are actually right now proposing that Princeton Seminary consider 15% uh, of its endowment, which is valued at a one billion endowment, that 15% of that endowment uh, be taken and used towards African-American student needs, towards the creation and, maintain and maintenance, fully funded um, black church study center, as well as some endowed chairs in African-American history or the history of African diasporas, as well as another line. But the point here is that this is the call. Now, 15%, one could say it could be more, right, than the 15%. Um, but what's been interesting to me, again, concerning this uncomfortability surrounding language, surrounding this call to be civil in order to get things done, has been 
how the reparations conversation has played out in our community. What I've noticed is that in our conversations with the students, oftentimes the administration as well as the faculty are literally afraid of students' rage. They want to control the conversation and manage black students in particular. And it seems that what's of real concern in some of the conversations, that this is public conversations, that's actually online, everything that I'm talking about at PTS, um, is sort of this fear that in students being able to express however they want to express it, how they feel about the ongoing institutional disenfranchisement of an institution that has a pretty serious history and record, an ongoing record of discrimination, institutional racism, it's interesting to me that what sits front and center, it's not the pain and the racial trauma of the students. It's the fear of how they will receive and how will they be able to manage the student's frustration. In other words, there's a white anxiety that just moves throughout the whole building, right now throughout the entire institution. And they think that respectability is central to the conversation. So you have calls for civility. But I, I want to sort of ask this question, is it? Civility, the call to civility. Now I want to be clear that civility can often be a very necessary practice, particularly when I think about nations around the world who have been racked by forms of militarized violence. But I'm interested in this particular liberal call for civility that is used as a political tool of manipulation. It's a calculated move in order to suppress the radical actions that need to transpire in institutions that are structured in white dominance. And so part of the way I see the Black Manifesto, what Foreman is up to, is um, that he wanted to indict white churches, not only the conservative churches, but the liberal ones. He comes to Riverside. He goes to the church. And there were others going to different churches. I'm thinking here of Detroit, for example, where they were disrupting uh, services. That they're going to churches, even those churches that understood that they were on the right side of history, that understood themselves to already be doing a particular kind of work in addressing racism. And Foreman reminds them that there is a work, this reparative work, that sits at the center of what they must attend to. So, of course, as I said, the first move has been about first reclaiming Cali House, that, the form, that Foreman, the Black Manifesto, moving all the way through aspects of Randolph and King's work, that this sits within in my opinion, the Cali House tradition, black women who are raising their voices creatively. But then secondly, to think about the conversations surrounding revolutionary tactics and oftentimes this really problematic call for civility that needs to be attended to in discussing reparations. But then I want to finally, in my remaining moments, turn to then thinking about this in a more explicitly theological key why reparations is central to the Christian witness, that it's a theological imperative. So the manifesto made reparations a theological issue, which entail the response of white churches. This foreman argues through this doc document, reparations would be central to Christian identity. If they wanted to be Christian, they would perform restitution. A number of progressives as I imagine Foreman, as he's introducing this document, are comfortable when we perhaps talk about reparations as a political response, but they start to feel unsure if we frame it as a theological imperative. Isn't, you know, isn't that about Jesus died on the cross sort of for our sins and rose on the third day and we confess him with our mouth and believe in our heart. I mean, right, th this is sort of historically the, the sort of the main narrative of how a number of churches in America think about the gospel mandate. But Foreman says that reparations is inherently theological. 
it's not additionally theological. It is inherently theological. Um, I agree with that. So let me offer a couple of examples as I conclude on how we might more explicitly reflect theologically on reparations. And I want to say this beyond the sort of common mantra, loving your neighbor as yourself, that's really important. But I think that similar to the question that Jesus asked the scribe, who is your neighbor? We tend to get stuck on that. Um, so something sort of beyond that. So consider this first, first sort of insight I'm thinking about. When we turn to the Gospels, we see that Jesus is clear that reparations or restitution to those who have been exploited and rendered vulnerable is not optional, but required. Consider Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus in Luke 19. Zacchaeus is a tax collector who has participated in Roman imperial oppression against marginalized Jewish populations. Jesus sits with Zacchaeus, but is clear with Zacchaeus on what his reparative response needed to be. And that this reparative response that Zacchaeus was tasked to do was not simply and only a political response, but was more deeply a theological response. In his encounter with Zacchaeus, I want to suggest that Jesus sets forth a reparations ethic. Black British theologian Anthony Reddy asserts that Zacchaeus is expected to give back that which he has stolen so that he can be reconciled with others and God. Reconciliation cannot occur until he has given back what he has stolen. I recognize that for some theologians and biblical scholars, it would be considered a stretch to interpret this interpersonal encounter between Zacchaeus and Jesus on a structural systemic level. Such encounters, so the argument goes, do not always translate perfectly within larger institutional context. I want to take that seriously. You have conservative voices that simply say it's a personal ethic altogether, but you have some other voices. I mean, I would, I would consider myself standing in the tradition of Reinhold Niebuhr, who would essentially say that there is no perfect justice, right? And in some ways, some of the ethics that you find in the Bible, they do, they do not translate into larger institutional uh, settings uh, where power and interest sort of mark and characterize what the world is, right? So I want to take that seriously. But I do want to say that while imperfect, I want to say that this encounter that Jesus has with Zacchaeus does indeed translate, while imperfectly, into a larger structural context. I think that Jesus' own reparations ethics, when he tells, give back what has been stolen, and you then can be reconciled with others and with God, it sheds light on what is central to God's economy, which includes restitution and real material repair as the grounding of God's salvific work in history. So God's salvific work is not merely the existential, but it is also the material. Such discussions are not separate or unrelated to the reign of God. Instead, Jesus' own thoughts here to Zacchaeus provide evidence that reparative work is kingdom work. It is part of what constitutes the unfolding of the good news, as it is a counter-imperial logic and practice. And most importantly, what I think is being communicated in this encounter is that Zacchaeus' salvation could only be made complete in his action to repair that Zacchaeus' salvation would only be fulfilled and complete through, with his action to repair. How does that translate into this moment, even in thinking about the salvific work of history, what God has done in Jesus Christ, that salvation history is always ongoing, redemption is always seen as ongoing, but that a part of that redemption is not fulfilled or complete until what has been stolen is returned and repaired and, 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 and restitution has occurred. Likewise, white Christians should see themselves, I would argue, as held underneath the same signs of the times with the Zacchaeus commissioning of sorts. 
that the reign of God involves repair as one's spiritual act of worship. What might it mean to wrestle with how Jesus' ministry empowers white Christian communities to see reparations not only as a theological imperative, but as a spiritual act of worship. And there's a second consideration as I take my seat. I also want to consider how reparations resets notions and practices of repentance. Repentance in some Christian traditions is, is too easily seen as verbal in the form of simple apologies. So in this account, repentance involves acknowledging wrongdoing in the past, feeling contrition for injury that has been caused, and promising to not do it again in the future. The future in this account is a qualitatively different point on the time continuum than the past. The past and the future are interrelated in this account, but located at different points altogether. The call for repentance stresses, in this account, stresses to leave behind the past by not committing the same infractions again. But this view of time, I would argue, this view of temporality in thinking about repentance has no way of tracking how the past stretches into the present, how the past is the future how the past is a becoming into the present. So, in my estimation, then, we get repentance wrong. And we get repentance wrong because we have a distorted idea of time, of temporality. And I want to note here that in some ways, I think part of it is just hegemonic interest, so I don't want to in some ways say that where people get repentance wrong is simply this insufficient notion of time. I think that there's real interest. In, in, other, in other words, white interest is very important to why, why white communities do not take up this very important work. But I also do think that the past is construed in a very particular way within this country. And it deeply shapes how we think about the gospel and how we, gospels and how we think about salvation history and therefore how we think about repentance. Consider, for example, in talking about temporal, temporality and time and its relationship to repentance. Consider how Pueblo and indigenous people of the Americas see time as round, not as a long linear string. If time is round, then something that happened 500 years ago may be quite immediate and real in the present, returning and shaping what futures are even possible. To acknowledge, to acknowledge the injury and injustice of slavery then is to acknowledge the truth of how such injustices persist in the present. We need to repent from gross racism, not simply because it existed then, but because it exists now and shapes the futures we articulate. The current problem is that so many white Christians convince themselves that time has no curvature the image of time being round. I think the curvature of time is a deep theological insight. God's economy of salvation in Jesus Christ is about telling the truth of how social sin is always upon us, with us, acting in us in cultural and material ways. To repent is to know what the truth is, if it is to be acknowledged at all. The truth that past racial injustice is our present, not a part of our present. It is our present and even future if we do not change and embrace real reparative work. And to be clear, I think that there are various forms of reparative work. I think material is critically important, but there are various forms and we must repent Rich communities must, re rich uh, Christian communities must repent. White communities must repent. And I believe that this repentance is about reparations work. So I am not naive to the fact that reparations is a hard conversation to have in this nation or in, the, in, in our churches. But I do think we need to remind this nation and church communities that white church communities need to be reminded of these two insights. That reparations is an American tradition and that reparations is central to the Christian witness.
And I pray that we will continue to do this hard but necessary work unapologetically and with the spirit of boldness. Thank you. given us a lot of food for thought, and I believe that there is much work left to be done as we continue the dialogue and the discussion about reparations. Coming to the stage now are our two first responders who are going to participate in a little conversation with Dr. Day, and I'd like to introduce uh, the two of them uh, briefly. First, uh, Gail Walker is the executive director of IFCO, Pastors for Peace. IFCO is the interreligious foundation for a community organization, and it was founded in 1967 by progressive church leaders and activists. They're involved in a lot of activities uh, nationally and internationally, including working uh, with uh, Cuba, and they have sponsored many uh, trips to Cuba. Many Riversiders have also participated uh, in those trips. And then secondly, Reverend Dr. Peter Heltzel is the founding director of the Micah Institute at New York Theological Seminary. He uh, has been involved in lots of activities over the years. Uh, he seeks to educate New York City faith leaders on issues of social and economic justice, and uh, I would like them to give their responses. First, uh, Gail Walker will uh, respond, and Reverend Dr. Hetzel will also join the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to first uh, just acknowledge and give um, a deep appreciation to Riverside for organizing this uh, activity. Um, Reverend I know she had to leave, it looks like, but uh, uh, Reverend Amy, but also uh, Reverend Kevin uh, Van Hook. Uh, it's just a tremendous opportunity for us to, to really um, come together to have a very important conversation. And of course, the uh, social justice uh, ministry, it's grateful for the opportunity to be here with uh, this esteemed panel. But I want to turn my, my attention right this moment to um, Dr. Day, that was uh, an incredibly well thought out and um, uh, e explanation, I think, historically, um, but you really touched on so many elements. It's almost hard to, to figure out just the, the most appropriate way to respond. But I think that clearly the, the arguments that were uh, in existence not only in 1960. 5, 66, 67, but uh, certainly as you just rightfully laid out um, historically uh, that we've, we've had to deal with exist um, as much today, if not more so. Um, the definition of reparations, I think, is a, is, is, is a challenge, and I think that that's part of what we, uh, all of us that are concerned and um, focused on the, uh, the issue of, of justice, uh, must really uh, look to, to do, to discern. What, how do we define reparations in 2019? Uh, what, what does that uh, look like? Um, the reality is that so much of what you pointed to, I just took a few notes, because there was, as like I said, there were so many uh, cogent um, uh, points, but the issue of language, which is dear to me, because part of my training is media and journalism, so the whole idea of etymology and, and really exploring, you know, what, what does language look like um, is, I think, critical. Um, the uh, rhetorical strategy that you refer to um, is, is key. Um, and I do think that what uh, James Foreman and, and others, because I think there, there were other, other folk besides 
James Foreman himself, who was really central to this struggle, um, that the language was intentionally provocative. Uh, you know, I mean, the whole idea was to shake things up uh, because that's what uh, we, we need to be doing and needed to be doing then and need to be doing now. Um, the idea of force, I really, that just, oh, you really hit on such an important point that, uh, that it's not just physical. And the, my organization has been engaged in, um, as following in the steps of, of Gandhi and King, uh, the whole idea of organizing and uh, using civil disobedience as a way to really draw attention to injustice. Uh, more recently, the work that we've been doing at IFCO has been uh, associated with Cuba and the, the um, criminal blockade against Cuba, but using civil disobedience as a way to really um, highlight uh, what injustice looks like. Um, so the power, as you said, the power of truth is uh, an, an, another key, key point. Uh, but so many different things that can be said. I just want to maybe stop and pass to my brother here, but just to say that your 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 final or part of the the, the final uh, message of, about uh, injustice or the uh, past injustice being um, not only our present but our future if we don't do the work, the uncomfortable work that we need to do in order to have the conversation, but also ultimately to come up with concrete tangible boots on the ground, you know, um, uh, ideas about how it is that we really uh, embrace this moment uh, of taking reparations to another level, taking it beyond words, taking it beyond rhetoric, uh, and, uh, and, and organizing together um, on all of us, um, including our, our, our white allies. That's a very important piece of the, uh, the work that I feel that, that we've got to be doing. So just a, a few um, thoughts that come to mind based on the very uh, powerful uh, presentation that you made. Good afternoon, Riverside. I want to thank Pastor Kevin Van Hook and Pastor Amy Butler, my mentor in the ministry, for her insightful sermon this Sunday on interruption, just as Foreman interrupted Riverside 50 years ago, the Holy Spirit and fire interrupted us in Dr. Carrie Day's talk. And Pastor Amy closed out her sermon saying, God is interrupting us to go out and love the world back to life. And this is in the context of resurrection and the call to love the world back to life. So I think in light of Dr. Day's keynote, reparations is what loving the world back to life looks like in the economic realm, in the kind of socio-spiritual economic realm. But spe specifically the economic, because I agree with Gail that when we talk about reparations, we're talking about compensation. We're talking about a payment. And yes, even in 1988, President Ronald Reagan, and yes, I said Reagan, signed a bill to give $20,000 to every person of Japanese descent for the internment incarceration during World War II. So we, it has been done, and we need as uh, Dr. Day has pointed out, to continue this tradition, this democratic tradition since emancipation. And, and, and for me as a, a fellow constructive theologian who has so much love and respect for Dr. Day and, and your work, I, I appreciated you saying that the work of reparations is central to the gospel witness. And there was one passage in the Black Manifesto where Foreman says, and this is on the bottom of page nine, the true test of white Christian faith and belief in the cross and the words of the prophets will certainly be put to a test as we seek legitimate and extremely modest reparations for our role in developing the industrial base of the Western world through our slave labor. 
So my interruption in the work of reparations was when I found out from my uncle that my family on my mother's side had owned slaves. And that was, you know, my heart sank and it was really a disappointing moment in my life. But today I have the courage to publicly acknowledge that. And I want to, you know, to my sisters, Emily, and to Carrie and to Gail, um, in the spirit of the Episcopal threefold process of reparations, lament black suffering, apologize for the way that my white ancestors have harmed your black ancestors, and confess and repent through calling on all white Christians to give of our lives and give of our money. Now I'm giving through my life in as much as the Mike Institute after hearing Reverend Mary Folks last, last month decided to launch a, a reparations task force. So we, we will enter that three year process. You can come join us Thursday, May 16th at 12 noon for lunch in 10 T that's the 10th floor of the tower here at Riverside. If you want to be part of that reparations task force, but we got to understand, brother Jim Fairbanks, that we as white folks, we need to follow, as, as Foreman said, black leadership, but we also have to give. So today, I would like to personally make a contribution to IFCO and call on all whites, Christians in the house and all online, to join me, if you're online, you can give to Gail's wonderful organization at if, ifconews.org, ifconews. But I just wanted to give Gail a, a check today in honor of James Foreman, because I couldn't come to this event 50 years after the Black Manifesto was dropped in this church without doing something. But this is simply a, um, a flare for what, a wake up call for white Americans to start giving on a regular basis, to t start serving on a regular basis. I I'm inspired by um, my, the seminary I graduated from, Gordon Conwell, started an institute for the study of black Christian experience. And in the evangelical world, this is a really big deal. So when I got a check uh, last year for, for $1,000 from the family farm on my mom's side, I gave that $1,000 to the Institute for the Study of Black Christian Experience at Gordon Conwell Seminary. And I'm glad they're trying to diversify the faculty and strengthen the reparations movement on campus. I'm inspired by Princeton Seminary and their call to reparations and the, and, the, and the courageous work that Dr. Day and the black seminarians are doing at Princeton. And I am very proud and excited about my own seminary, New York Theological Seminary, calling Lakeisha Wal Walren to be our new president. So we will have a black female president who I can follow and support as we move into this prophetic intercultural future. Thank you, thank you very, very much. We have heard a lot today on this 50th anniversary of the Black Manifesto. And I would like to again thank our guests, Dr. Day and uh, Peter and Gail for those words of encouragement. And, and also to thank them for the great work that they are doing. They are, in fact, warriors in the struggle, and they have been involved for a long time, and the struggle continues, and there is more work to be done. I'd like to ask Reverend Van Hook to come forward uh, as we close out. Thank you all so much for attending. Uh, you know, we've looked back on 50 years, uh, but we also have to think about moving forward.
And this is just the first of many conversations that we're going to have and various programmatic initiatives that are designed to help us move forward with the fight for reparations. So this is the beginning, not the end, of this commemoration. I want to thank you so much. And uh, Reverend Van Hook, let's have your closing remarks and benediction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. And just to piggyback on, on what Dr. Anderson has already said, I just want to, just one more time, a round of applause for everyone who played a major part in making today happen. Each of our special guests and all of you all for being here as well. As we prepare to leave, please uh, receive this blessing. As we depart from this place, but never from the presence of our God for, of radical re revolution, let us remember the prophetic traditions of Callie House, Martin King, James Foreman, as we continue the struggle for justice in our world. Lord, give us a holy discomfort at easy answers. Give us the courage to fight for what we know to be right. And give us the determination and resilience to let no one turn us around as we strive to do your work in this world. And the people of God said, amen. amen. Thank you all. Go in peace. Make them.